Hi students, today we are going to look at the poem Absences by Dom Morais. Dom Morais was an Indian writer and poet who was born in Bombay and uh, uh, he had a tormented relationship with his mother Beryl who was confined to a mental asylum since his childhood. And he published his first collection of poems, a beginning in the year 1957. And when he was 19, when he was still an undergraduate, he became the first Indian to win the Hawthorne Prize and was presented with 100 pounds and a silver medal by Lord David Cecil at the Arts Council of Britain on 10th July 1958. He edited magazines in London, Hong Kong and New York and later he became the editor of the Asia magazine in 1971. He scripted and directed over 20 television documentaries for the BBC and ITV. He was a war correspondent in Algeria, Israel and Vietnam and in 1976 he joined the United Nations. Maurice conducted one of the first interviews of Dalai Lama after the Tibetan spiritual leader fled to India in 1959 and uh, he lived up to 2004. Some of his major works include A Beginning, the first book of poems which was the winner of the Hawthorne Prize, uh, Poems, Gone Away, John Nobody, Absences, Collected Poems, Serendip, and so on. The poem that we are going to learn today is taken from the collection, from the, which is titled Absences again, uh, the book of poems. We'll read the poem once and then move into the analysis. Absences. Smear out the last star, no light from the islands or hills. In the great squire, the prolonged vowel of silence makes itself plainly heard round the ghost of a headland. Clouds, leaves, shreds of bird eddy hindering the wind. No vigils left to keep, no enemies left to slaughter. The rough roofs of the slops, loosely thatched with splayed water, only shelter microliths and fossils. Unwatched, the rainbows build on the architraves of hills. No wounds left to be healed. No body left to be beautiful. No polyp admiral to sip blood and whiskey from a skull while fingering his warships. Terrible relics by tide rays untouched. The stromalites breathe. Bubbles plop on the surface disturbing the balance of death. No sound would be heard if so much silence was not heard. Clouds scuff like sheep on the cliff. The echoes of stones are restored. No longer any foreshore or any abyss. This world only held together by its variety of absences. The poet has talked about the reason why he wrote the poem Absences. I caught him. I came back to Bombay from Madhya Pradesh in early 1982, not knowing exactly what I would do next. Leela had been appointed editor of a magazine and was away most of the day. During this time, I wandered around the city. I visited scantily stocked bookshops. I walked by the polluted sea. I did this one afternoon when the tide was low. There were beached boats on the wet sand and across the shimmery gauze like water beyond, a single island lay with a look of solitude. There was nobody about. A peculiar shiver ran down my spine. And at first, I thought I must be ill. Then I recognized my own symptoms. I had not felt like this for 17 years.
Certain words and phrases came to my mind. I went home, sat down and began to write a poem. It was about what if, what it would be like if everyone in the world was dead. As I worked, I felt pure power coming out of me. I was concentrated to such an extent that the world around me did, in fact, seem dead. There was only me left and my writing hand. It was a sensation that I had forgotten, slightly unpleasant, but simultaneously exceptionally exciting. After about four hours, I could not continue any more. I followed an old habit and put what I had written aside for some days. During these days, I worried. What if when I went back to the poem, it was no longer there, was no longer as good as I had thought while at work on it? When I returned to my notebook, the two days being up, I found it was still there and I could see some of what needed to be done. I continued to work on it. It was protean, taking on different shapes as I worked, until at last one strong shape remained. I typed this out and called it absences. It was the first poetry I had written in 17 years, which I felt was poetry. It was nothing like I had previously written, but partly because of that, I felt once more what Cecil De Lewis called the poet's inward pride, the certainty of power. Perhaps I should caught it here. I feel a tremendous pride in it still. Not because of its quality, but because it was the precursor of a great deal of new poetry in the years to come, a John the Baptist. So as we see in this long long um, dialogue from Dom Morais, we understand that he started writing this from uh, solitude because he had just been back to Bombay and he did not know what to do next. And in that state of solitude, in that state of solitude, when he once visited the beach, uh, he felt like writing these poems. And as, it wrote, as he wrote it down, he feels that uh, there is some kind of power coming out of the words that he has given. And he says that he could witness that it was taking different shapes and one strong shape remained. Coming back to the poem, the title itself is relevant, Absences. Now, as we heard uh, from Dom Bodes, the reason why he titles it Absences is that is because he felt that that was the only one powerful shape that continued in spite of everything else that changed around it. So he uses the word absences to talk about solitude, to talk about the deadness, the, the lifeless state of uh, life around him. So uh, it is a metaphor for life itself, especially when we look at it from an autobiographical perspective. It represents himself, it represents his solitude, it represents the absence of meaning in his life. It represents the feelings of loss, of homelessness, of the lack of family, of the lack of roots, nationality, an instinct to withdraw when faced with problems. So the title becomes relevant. And it is to be noted that he uses the concept of negation throughout. To say a few things to bring out that strong shape of absence in his mind, he uses presence always. He uses the presence of things to talk about its absence. So the concept of negation itself represents the meaninglessness of life. So the first stanza goes like this. Smear out the last star no lights from the islands or hills. In the great squire, the prolonged vowel of silence makes itself plainly heard round the ghost of a headland, clouds, leaves, shreds of birds, eddy hindering the wind. <laughs> 
So if you recall what Dom Morais talks about his poem, he says that he stands on a beach side, sees an island somewhere inside the sea and uh, he imagines that the whole world around him is dead and he is the only living person. And in such a case, as he imagines, he feels that the last star also would be wiped out. There would be no lights around him from the islands or from the hills. And in that darkness, in that complete darkness, there will be a pronounced voice of this silence which would be heard throughout. If you just try to imagine it this way, silence has its own its own noise. Imagine yourself being locked up in a room with no light, nothing, a vacuum. You can still hear the silence, you can still sense the silence. So he refers to that and says the prolonged vowel of silence makes itself plainly heard. And where does that happen? Round the ghost of a headland. A headland is an area of prolonged land extension into the sea. So the reference to the headland is not as a, a physical place, but it is the ghost of a headland. So in that darkness, he cannot see the headland. He can only imagine that there is a headland. He can only imagine that there is a ghost, um, a vague feeling of a headland being there. And he says, in that darkness, in that profound silence, he can sense the clouds, leaves and shreds of bird, eddy. Eddy is this circular movement of the wind uh, which takes up everything that is on the ground and it moves in a circular, circular motion. So all these aspects, the clouds, leaves and shreds of bird, they hinder the movement of this uh, current of wind. So here in this stanza we see that he talks about the absence of light when he says that smear out the last star, no light from the island. He refers to the absence of sound. He talks about the pro prolonged vowel of silence which is heard and he also talks about the absence of life because the sh birds are no more there that's why he refers to them as shreds of birds, the leaves which have fallen from the trees and the clouds. They all hinder the wind. They all hinder the, the, the circular movement of the wind. Here we can see that the prolonged vowel of silence makes itself plainly heard is a figure of speech which is called antithesis. It is a figure of speech where two opposite ideas are put together in a sentence to achieve a contrasting effect. So here, when he says that there is a vowel of silence, there is a sound of silence which is heard that becomes antithesis. That Those are two opposite ideas, silence and hearing put together in a sentence. Moving on to the second stanza. It goes like this, no vigils left to keep, no enemies left to slaughter, the rough roofs of the slops, loosely thatched with splayed water, only shelter microliths and fossils. Unwatched, the rainbows build on the architraves of hills, no wounds left to be healed. So this stanza does not seem to be uh, talking about what the things in the previous stanza. Yes, the common connecting thread is absence, absence of light, absence of sound, absence of sensory perceptions. But here it is more of a post-war setting. So here we see that the life itself is absent. There is no life because there is no one to keep vigil, to keep um, the, the town or that place safe. And there are no enemies left to slaughter. There are no enemies who are trying to come and attack that particular place. So no life, no human life itself in that sense. And going back to what Domares says, he imagined that the world around him was dead. So no vigils left to keep, no enemies, which signifies the absence of life itself.
and what does he see there he can see only the roofs of slops which are thatched with splayed water and that shelter microliths and fossils microliths are small weapons that were made out of the stone which is called the flint and fossils as we know those are uh, the remains of a once living being uh, which is undermined recently so here he says that the only things that seem to uh, seem to bear witness of the life that was there once are the microliths and fossils because for the microliths to be used they had to be certain humans and fossils are the evidence of uh, the life that was there in the past and he says that the process in the nature continues to be so the rainbows build on the architraves of hills on the uh, on the imagined columns of the hills so there are rainbows but there is no one to watch them that's why he says unwatched so the word unwatched also signifies the absence of life and no wounds left to be healed because who would imagine a dead person's wounds to be healed so overall this stanza also talks about a post war setting which signifies the absence of life and uh, the center of focus here is uh, not the presence but what is not there so to talk about the absences he has to bring in certain elements of presences because when he says there are no visuals no enemies uh, it in a way signifies that there were visuals there were enemies once upon a time similarly when he says that uh, the uh, roofs of the slopes only uh, shelter microliths and fossils he refers to this idea of the presence of life which was there once upon a time so that is about the second stanza the third stanza goes like this nobody left to be beautiful no polyp admiral to sip blood and whiskey from a skull while fingering his warships terrible relics by tide race untouched the stromolites breathe bubbles plop on the surface disturbing the balance of death if you note if the previous stanza was about a post war setting on the land here this is a post war setting a kind of a similar setting but which happens in the sea he begins the stanza by saying there is nobody left to be beautiful only if there is life there is a sense of beauty but here there is no nobody left to be beautiful and no polyp admiral polyp admiral is a reference to a person as uh, like um, a similar to um, the one that you see in the picture here polyp is a uh, a tumor of the nose or uh, the a bulging of the nose and a, an admiral uh, who sips blood and whiskey from a skull while fingering his warships so here uh, we go to this idea of a skull cup as you can see in the picture a skull cup is a drinking vessel or eating bowl made from an inverted human skull that has been cut away from the rest of the skull so this use of a human skull as a drinking cup uh, was either part of a ritual or it signified some sort of victory uh, on the part of the uh, the people who fight so here uh, when dom morris says that there is no polyp admit admiral to sip blood and whiskey from a skull while fingering his warship it refers to the absence of victory itself it refers to the absence of people fighting for their survi survival and he calls all these terrible relics because they remain uh, as relics now with no life but surprisingly he says that the stromolites breathe there is some kind of a terrible feeling because the already already dead things which have become fossils which have become the stromolites they seem to be breathing because 
from under the sea he can sense bubbles plopping on the surface of the water and he feels that this kind of disturbs the balance of death the idea of uh, human death uh, or the idea of the absence of life which is made uh, visible in uh, in the uh, lines which uh, of the third stanza so the stromalites breathing or the fossils breathing is again an instance of antithesis the fourth stanza no sound would be heard if so much silence was not heard clouds scuff like sheep on the cliff the echoes of stones are restored no longer any for sure or any abyss this world only held together by its variety of absences so in this stanza he talks about the inevitability of absence to recognize the present so if there is no absence which is uh, complemented by the presence of that thing then it would not be valued just like we say that uh, we recognize the value of eyesight only when we lose it similarly he says that no sound would be appreciated if silence was not heard so only because silence exists only because this absence exists sound is appreciated similarly as he looks around he sees that the clouds scuff like sheep on the cliff which is a simile that is used here to represent another presence so earlier if it was a dark setting now it has changed into a setting a dim setting where he can see the clouds scuffing like sheep on the cliff similarly in the beginning if there was an absence of sound he says that the echoes of stones are restored and finally he concludes that stanza by saying that the world is held together by its variety of absences so he ends the poem in a very philosophical knot and says that the presence of life can be found in the midst of these absences and to recognize life to appreciate life to appreciate the presence of life we need to acknowledge the absence of life itself so we see that antithesis is a commonly used figure of speech throughout this poem to talk about absence he needs to talk about the loss of presence or the lack of presence of that particular thing so antithesis seems to be a commonly used figure of speech here the other figures of speech include simile metaphor um metaphor is the absence itself the absence is a metaphor for life itself and uh, all we need to understand about this poem is how autobiographical it is because as we saw from the beginning uh, dom morris talks about it talks about absences from his own personal sense of loss and solitude he extends that personal sense of solitude and loss into the things that he sees around him it starts with the star it starts with the island moves into the things in the the things that he sees around him then it moves into the past history of wars the meaninglessness of wars and then it moves into uh, the meaninglessness of uh, of the 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 life that is seen in the sea and finally he ends with a philosophical uh, conclusion that life itself is held together by its variety of absences so the idea of negation becomes important here so even though it might seem a little uh, difficult to understand uh, we get to experience the soul of the poem only when we understand it from his autobiographical perspective thank you